Good evening, everyone. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we're gathered, the Wurundjeri people and the clans of the Kulin Nation, who are the keepers of the stories of this land. I offer my respect and gratitude to them, to their elders past and present. I'd like to welcome everybody here tonight on behalf of the Wheeler Centre. It's my great pleasure and privilege tonight to introduce a man who really needs no introduction, Alexander McCall Smith. <laughs> Alexander was born in Rhodesia, now Zimbabwe, earned his PhD in law at the University of Edinburgh and is internationally renowned as an expert on medical law and bioethics. As fascinating as some of us might find it to discuss that aspect of Alexander's career, we are here tonight to talk about his other career, of course, as the writer of some of the world's best-loved fiction. Since his first children's novel was published in 1980, Alexander has published an astonishing 70 works of fiction, in addition to numerous medico-legal texts, and his books have been translated into 46 languages. His works include 14 novels in the number one Ladies Detective Agency series, which has sold over 20 million copies, and nine novels each in the 44 Scotland Street series and the Isabel Dalhousie Sunday Philosophy Club series. With a bibliography like this, I'm warning members of the audience that we may not get to touch on your very favourite of Alexander's books in the course of this interview. <laughs> However, we will allow 15 minutes at the end for questions, um, and there will be uh, roving mics available for you to speak. Uh, the place for your compliments, though, is in the signing queue after the show. So please join me again in welcoming Alexander McCall. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you so much. Sandy, 70 books in 34 years, if my count is correct. Do you ever sleep? Well, yes, I do. I do. Uh, quite a lot, actually. I'm, I'm, I'm quite lazy. And uh, um, I find uh, I, I write at, uh, at very special times. Uh, I often get up very early in the morning and, and write. So I might get up at four in the morning and write for two hours, two and a half hours, and then go back to bed afterwards. And uh, I find that that's quite a good time to, uh, time to write uh, because there are no disturbances. Um, I'm also very lucky and I'm very conscious of my good fortune in this respect, in that I write quite quickly. I write, I write a thousand words an hour when I'm, uh, when I'm writing. And uh, I don't say it in any boastful way, but th that's the way it works. Mm. And so uh, that enables me to write three or four books a year. Mm. Um, it's breaking all known rules of publishing, uh, because the known rules of publishing say only one book uh, a year and not every year. Yes. Uh, but uh, I, I write three or four, Keep them sometimes hanging on. five. So, you, you break a lot of rules, actually, and I'm going to yeah. quiz you about that in the course of this evening's <laughs> dis discussion. Maybe later on. Uh, later on <laughs> when we've got to know each other a bit better. <laughs> yes. um, I wanted to start by talking about Precious from Way yes. and the Number One Ladies Detective Agency series. I've heard you describe this as a love letter to Botswana. Can you tell us how that love affair began? Well, yes, it's, uh, I, I've never made any um, uh, really se secret of the fact that I'm, I'm writing uh, in a very complimentary way about Botswana. Uh, these are very positive books about Botswana. I admire the country. Uh, so they aren't critical in, in, in any sense. And uh, it started uh, a long time ago uh, when I was living for a short time in Swaziland, which is another country, small country in, in that part of Africa, uh, on the other side of that bit of the, the continent. And um, I um, was working at the University of Swaziland there, which had a link with the University of Botswana and the University of Lesotho, and I had a long association with those three uh, universities. And uh, I started to go across to Botswana to see friends of mine who, who, who lived there, who spent most of their lives in Botswana, in fact. And uh, uh, that's when I first started to visit the country. And I remember in those days when I went across, um, uh, I was just uh, really very surprised by uh, and indeed delighted by the atmosphere that I found in Botswana. And I, I felt that I w was actually in a good country. Uh, it's extraordinary, you know. You, you can go somewhere and you can feel immediately uh, what, we, what we might today call the vibe. Uh, and uh, uh, there is, there's an atmosphere uh, sometimes in a, in a, in a country. And I, I just felt that very strongly about Botswana. Incidentally, uh, I find that when I'm in Australia, when I'm in this country, uh, I've, I've, I always feel very happy in, in Australia. There's something cheerful about 
uh, Australia, which is, which is very striking. There's a very friendly feeling to it. And, of course, conversely, uh, one can go to a country where you feel the opposite, where you think, I, I really don't want to be want to be here mm. and uh, I won't name <laughs> those countries <laughs> but I mean there are there are times when you, you you're in a place and you realize this is a, mm. uh, a, a, a bad uh, a bad place um, but with Botswana I felt this extraordinary uh, sense that this was a good country it had a it had a remarkable history it had been consistently democratic uh, since 1966 since independence um, and there was a, a people treated one another in what I thought was a rather nice way. And I thought, this is an interesting place. And they were fairly, they were fairly cautious people, quiet people. Um, but I've, I found that uh, rather intriguing. And the following year, I, I spent most of that year actually working in Botswana. And that's when I got to know it uh, better. Mm. And um, that, I suppose, is the, is, is the beginning of this long association with this, uh, this country, although at that stage, I had no idea that I would engage in this very long literary conversation mm. uh, with it, which uh, I, I eventually did. But I think the ideas were, at that stage, beginning to bubble away in my subconscious mind. Percolate as they do. Uh, that's right. Um, we touched on this uh, when we were just having a chat backstage. Um, I write, for my sins, write crime novels set in Thailand, and when mm. I first approached a publisher, I was told I needed my Australian character to uh, play a stronger, more central role relative to the Thai characters. How did publishers react when you first came to them with a novel set in Botswana, featuring a Botswana cast, yes. entirely Botswana cast, and yeah. a traditionally built woman in the lead? Well, that's right. Now, that's a very interesting thing that you should say, that, that you encountered that, that particular view when you, when you started writing your your Thai novels. Uh, and I did, right at the beginning, when I wrote the number one ladies' detective agency first, the very first book, I encountered something akin to that, uh, but it was a little bit different. And I encountered a scepticism uh, about it. And, uh, well, Botswana, you know, what's this in Botswana? And why is this so gentle? That was a very specific mm. thing uh, that I, I actually had. Um, right at the very beginning, uh, I, was, I was told that this wasn't, uh, there wasn't enough edge to it. Uh, this is, edge is a terrific word uh, that people bandy about. Uh, and uh, if, you, if you, you say to people, you've got to have more edge, and then they sort of shift uncomfortably. Uh, because, and it's very difficult to define what edge is, uh, but I didn't have enough. Of, uh, <laughs> clearly, clearly, I mean... I've been trying, yeah. to, I've been trying to develop more edge uh, <laughs> uh, since then. But it's jolly difficult if you don't know what it is. It's, uh, um, you, you, you look in the mirror and you try to look edgy. You, and you, you, first thing you have to do is suck in your cheeks. That's very important. That's important. <laughs> and frown, I imagine. Uh, you, well, you frown, you look, in, you look edgy. Uh, you, look, uh, you look intense. You look vaguely as if you're suffering from heartburn. <laughs> and it's fact, it's fact rather like, have you noticed um, young boy bands, uh, <laughs> may, these, these uh, pop musicians, these young males, sort of, they're about 18, 19, or some of them sort of eight, seven or eight, but anyway, you see, <laughs> you see them standing there, and have you noticed they're all sucking in their cheeks, <laughs> and they're all looking very disgruntled. <laughs> And they're obviously seeking edge as they, well. Oh, they've got edge oh, by the really bucket load. Oh. Yeah, no, they're, Don't we envy no, them? No, that's, uh, they, we, we, we can't tell. We can't tell them anything about edge. <laughs> no, no. Oh, no, no. We're, we're the ones who have to learn. We, we just get a little bit of edge from their chariot wheels as they go past a few, a few <laughs> flecks of edge. <laughs> I, I think that people who... who Doubt your edge. Don't read your books very closely because uh, I think there's a there's, edge. there's a steel yeah there is edge. Oh. There's a steeliness oh, Angela, to those how books. Kind. That's, so, that's so kind of you. You know you're not just saying that. No, you I'm really not just saying that. that. No, no, I've read them really closely. And because the audience thinks it's funny. They <laughs> They don't believe you. Well, they don't, they don't see what I see. I see right. a man who, ironically, for a specialist in medico-legal mm. bioethics, mm. breaks a hell of a lot of rules when it comes to writing. I mean, you think nothing of taking your readers on a segue or an aside. Yes. Um, 
un seemingly unrelated to the plot, but enormously um, evocative and, and mm -hmm. in illustrative of, of uh, life in Botswana. Um, oh. You're quite a rule breaker when it comes to those things. Well, I think I think these uh, literary rules are, th are there to be broken in, in a sense that uh, I, I'm quite happy to go off into the excursus, uh, go off at a tangent. Uh, I, I very much enjoy doing that. I do that a lot in my Scotland Street books, but I do that in in the, in the number one ladies' detective agency. Mara Motsui and Mara Makutsi can be sitting there, and suddenly Mara Motsui thinks about something which has got absolutely nothing to do with the with the subject, and that's great because that's how we think. Mm. That's how all of us think. Uh, we, if, if you, it'd be very interesting to have a transcription of our thoughts for the day and what we actually think uh, think about. It would be embarrassing for some people, uh, <laughs> particularly we're told men. Apparently, men uh, think about all sorts of impermissible things. Oh. Apparently. I thought All the embarrassment the would be that they'd have less thoughts. <laughs> Fewer. <laughs> well, let's not go there, as they say. This is, this is, this is another, that's another subject. That's another, we'll have another evening uh, discussing, discussing that. The material differences uh, but, between men and women. But I do think, I do think the, the, the idea of going off and, and thinking about things uh, which have n nothing to do with the, the matter in hand uh, is, is, is perfectly natural. Uh, it's stream of consciousness, of course. Uh, and uh, that's, that's how people... How people think. So, so we do get that with the with the number one ladies detective agency characters. We get it in the other other books. Mm. Off we go. Mm. And I think that the 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 readers actually quite like that. Or oh, if they don't like it, they've been very polite <laughs> and they haven't actually told me that they don't like that. Because I do have these tea scenes. You see, every so often yes. in my books, uh, I have the characters sitting down and drinking tea, and people feel that the, feel that the tea is very symbolic that there's this great symbolism in, in the drinking of tea. And in fact, it's not really. It's just a question of, I do that when I can't think of anything to, uh, <laughs> anything to write. So the characters have, have tea, and then, and, then, and then play resumes after the, uh, after the tea. Wonderful. Um, I wanted to ask you about... Uh, there's no tea, actually, in the children's books of uh, Precious and Watson, no. but there's some lovely... Um, mm -hmm. I've been reading these to my eight-year-old, um, and uh, there's some lovely asides when the author addresses the child, and I always notice that she perks up in relation to that voice coming directly to her. Um, my eight-year-old would like to know whether you're planning to pr publish any more books in this series, but I'd like to know whether this is all part of a cunning plan to groom a new generation of no, number one ladies detective no, agency no, fans. It's, it's nothing, so, books. nothing so Machiavellian as that. <laughs> but that's a good idea, actually. Isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> the latest one is called Precious and the Mystery of the Missing Line, and if you haven't seen the children's versions of the Precious from Watso books, I cannot recommend them highly tell, enough. Uh, tell your daughter that I, I am actually going to write another one. In fact, I'm meant to write it by May, so I should be sitting down and, and writing right now rather than talking to you. But nonetheless, <laughs> uh, I, am going to do, I am going to do another one of those. Oh, that's very... She'll be thrilled. Um, I, uh, I was wondering, in, in relation to what we were just discussing about your tangential... Well, I want to call your plot lines delta-like, actually. Right. To say well, that those tributaries are as rich and as interesting as the main kind of plot stream that's happening. I wonder, in, in fact, if you even consider the number one ladies' detective agency books to be crime novels. In I, don't, I, 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 I don't think they, they are. And I don't say that in any disrespectful sense to the practitioners um, such as yourself of, 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 the, of the crime novel, because uh, crime, uh, crime fiction is a very broad church. Um, and I think that I can f fit somewhere in that, but I'm way out at the, at, the, at, at the edge of it, in a sense, because I don't actually have crime in them. We have bad behaviour. Now, of course, <laughs> bad behaviour and crime, what's the distinction? Um, but uh, uh, it's, usually, it's usually some sort of um, issue in somebody's life that we're, we're looking at rather than, rather than crime as such. Uh, and there is this convention... Uh, in crime fiction uh, that you actually have to have uh, a murder. And the crime fiction, most people regard crime fiction, detective fiction, uh, as being dependent upon that, that you actually have, uh, you have a body. And indeed, in, the, in contemporary crime fic uh, fiction, uh, there's also a, a very strong presumption that you'll have the 
autopsy in the first couple of pages. And this is, this is really very, very important uh, because readers feel that they need to have an autopsy at the beginning, get rid of the autopsy, and then they go into the, into the, into the problem. Um, now, I don't deal with that at all, and, and, and I think it's a very odd concern uh, that crime writers have with, with murder, because murder is a very, very unusual crime. Mm. I mean, it does occur from time to time, but it's actually very, very uh, unusual, and, and most... Uh, most police officers will very rarely encounter a murder, and many policemen will, will have their entire career without ever having had to deal with a, a murder. So it's an unusual, uh, unusual crime, and I think crime writers should be more realistic uh, and that they should deal with more common offences, uh, such as uh, parking uh, <laughs> offences, uh, because par <laughs> parking, parking offences are endemic. I mean, there are a lot of parking offences. And I think it would be far more realistic, it would be far more sort of social realism if they dealt with these parking offences. And there could be very, very Indeed. interesting, uh, well, slightly interesting novels about uh, uh, parking, uh, parking I th offences. I think you've thrown out a real challenge to the crime writers in the house to write a gripping novel about parking about offences. parking <laughs> offences. Uh, oh, I think you could, you know. You, you laugh, but I think you could. I think you really, really could. You know, the mystery, there could be somebody, somebody's parking and somebody else's parking place. Who is it? Who, who... <laughs> the problem is once, once, once a real died in the world crime writers start writing on a yeah. plot like this, someone ends up being killed. Someone kills someone over a well, parking space. Well, I did. I, I myself wrote a, a story um, some years ago called No Place to Park, and, uh, <laughs> which explored this. And it was about a crime writer uh, who decided that he'd have to deal with parking offences. And so he, he goes off and he joins the parking squad. Uh, in, uh, in this particular town and he goes with the parking attendant and they see a car illegally parked and sort of this is a bit of a thrill and the parking attendant says well this is interesting look at his wheel it's over the edge there and hasn't got a ticket up hasn't paid his parking fee and whatnot and crime rate is very interesting and then they see that there's somebody in the car as they approach and as they approach this person looks at them and then drives off and there's a body under the car. <gasps> <laughs> See, you can make parking novels exciting. Um, there, are no, there are no dead bodies in the latest, uh, in the mm. number one latest detective agency series, which is, has the wonderful, they all have wonderful titles, but the Minor Adjustment Beauty Salon, absolutely beautiful title. Well, you know, may I just say on that title, uh, there the, are the, some wonderful titles to businesses in, in sub-Saharan sub African countries. They, they go in for very, very, uh, very nice titles for businesses. And I saw a little uh, beauty salon in Botswana years ago, and it was a little shack in the middle of nowhere, which is beauty salon, and it had its title on it, which was The Last Chance Beauty <laughs> Salon. <laughs> You must have been tempted to use that one. <laughs> oh, that's glorious. That is glorious. There's a lovely element in your books, which is set in more or less contemporary Botswana, where um, Precious, in particular, reflects on changes that are taking place in her country, for better or worse. And often she engages in these reflective conversations with her father. Yes. The late Obed, Obed. Ramotswe. And at one point, she is, in, in this book, she reassures her father's memory that Botswana has not changed, not in the, in, the way, in the things that really matter. I wonder, how do you keep pace with the changes there, and do you believe the things that really matter have stayed the same in that country? Well, that's very interesting. I, I, I do go to Botswana um, just about every year, and uh, I make a point of talking to people and and listening to what people say and, and, and looking around. And obviously there are changes, there are changes everywhere. If you go anywhere in the world, um, turn your back for a, for a year and suddenly there are new buildings and, and mm. um, the, the, the streets uh, seem to have changed and all, all of that sort of thing. And I think we do uh, experience a lot of change in, in our, um, in our uh, environment. Um, and yet um, the human qualities uh, can remain the same. So the heart of a country often remains the same, even when there's, there's change. And, and I suppose there have been extraordinary examples of, of the heart of a country surviving very, very adverse circumstances. Uh, one thinks, for example, of uh, Eastern Europe and how Eastern Europe uh, had a very long period uh, during which uh, they were oppressed. 
uh, and yet uh, the heart of those countries uh, remained there and, and, and emerged. So in spite of everything that had been done to them and everything that had been imposed upon them, uh, the, 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 the fundamental heart of those, 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 uh, those cultures was, uh, was intact. Interestingly enough, there's, a, there's a, a, an Australian professor um, who has uh, coined a new term called solastalgia uh, about uh, the sadness that people feel when they've been subjected to too much rapid change in their environment. Uh, it's a very um, uh, in interesting theory. He, 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 did, he took various cases. He, he did, I think it was a community in New South Wales where there'd been strip mining and, and people's environment had, had changed dramatically. And he, he also looked at a, um, a community in South Australia which had been very, very badly affected by drought and people had seen their... The, the, the environment die around them, their gardens die and everything. And he, he, he came up with this term, solastalgia, for the feeling of sadness that we have when we see t excessively rapid change mm. in our surroundings. And I find that quite interesting. Mm. And I think that we do feel that um, because we don't want everything to change. We want still to have something uh, that reminds us of what it was, what was there before. Mm. And this isn't a, a recipe for stasis or a recipe mm. for, 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 for no change at all. Yeah. But I do think that we have, to, we have to try to hold on to certain things that anchor us mm. in, in the world. Mm. And so Mara Matsui feels that about her country. She, she sees certain things changing in Botswana, but she, she sees the fundamental values still there. And, of course, they, 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 they are still there. And some of the things that she knew are still still there, and that's probably what most of us would want for ourselves. Yeah. We don't want to wake up in the morning and discover that everything has changed dramatically. We want to keep some things from the past, yeah. some associations, yeah. some feelings. And I think that's very Im Im important. And we need to tell people who keep urging us to change in every respect, to rearrange our furniture every day, no, we actually do want a certain amount of, of, of constancy, constancy as well. Does Mara Watsway get her optimistic attitude from you, or is it the other way around? <laughs> well, I, 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 uh, Mara Matsui, um, I, I, I created Mara Matsui in the sense that I, I made her up, and I, 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 I gave her words, so to speak. Uh, but I take the view that she exists. Uh, she doesn't exist in real terms, of course, but, but I, I think that she, she exists as a type. And, and the image of Mara Matsui is, is something um, that actually I learn from and I draw from rather than the other way around. Mara Matsui doesn't know about me. Uh, she's, uh, she's actually really... Um, she's more of a Clovis Anderson fan, isn't she? <laughs> yes, she's that. There was one occasion, one occasion in which I allowed myself to meet Mara Matsui in one of the books. And sometimes the readers write to me about it and say... We think we've seen you in it. And it's an occasion when Mara Matsui is having tea with her <laughs> friend in uh, Khabaroni. And her friend uh, produces uh, an album of photographs. And they're looking at photographs. And uh, Mara Matsui Su says, uh, who's that? And the friend says, that, that's a person who comes and stays with us from time to time. And Mara Matsui says, he's smiling at me. And that was, that was me, because the, the person... Uh, it, it, I described having tea with is a real person and indeed it's the person with whom I stay, the people with whom I stay when I'm in Botswana. So I allowed myself to see her, a photograph, and I smiled at her out of the photograph and she saw. And so we, we had that. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. <laughs> oh, well, Beautiful. there we are. And, uh, <laughs> uh, I love it. Um, I, I, we could talk about um, what's yeah. right for the whole time and um, easily uh, and for longer, but we're going to move on to your latest standalone novel now, which is called <clears throat> The Forever Girl. And it is set, it's released last month, and it's set largely in the Cayman Islands, which is a place I knew nothing about until I read this evocative book. Um, I wonder, are stories like the one in The Forever Girl inspired by the places you go, or do you go places looking for stories? I think, I think the former. I think these, these uh, are uh, inspired by, by the experience of the, of the place. So that particular book, The Forever Girl, starts off in the Cayman Islands. There's quite a lot of it in the Cayman Islands. Then it goes on to Scotland. Then it comes to Melbourne. Hmm. And uh, uh, then goes on to Singapore. So all of those are places that I've, I've been. 
and that I, I'm, I, I've got views on. And so, so it, it, it does, uh, I think it's place-led. Um, uh, that, that I think that, that that's right, that, that uh, places can inspire me. And I go to a place and I become intrigued about the lives that are led there. And um, so you can actually uh, work out where I've been mm. by reading my books, <laughs> <laughs> particularly Scotland Street books, because suddenly you go off to Cuba, and I've been in Cuba or whatever. And uh, so it's... Uh, It'd be it, a great PhD project in that, wouldn't it? Plotting Alexander McCall Smith's travels <laughs> via his... But what was it about the Caymans in particular that... Um, that inspired this? Uh, well, we, we have friends who, who live in the Cayman Islands and, and that's the only reason why we really went there. And we've been going there for some years and we go there and, and in fact, when I'm there, I find that I can write quite well in, in the Cayman Islands because, again, no disturbances and, and it's, 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 a, it's a nice pace of life. Um, it's, it's an odd place. It's, it's a, a, a little island. Grand Cayman is the biggest of the, of the group. It's a, group of very small islands, uh, Grand Cayman being the biggest, and uh, it's um, just below Cuba and to the left of Jamaica as you look at the map. And um, uh, there it is, uh, with a population of about 40-something uh, thousand, of which about 20,000 are expatriates. Uh, so it's a, it's a somewhat artificial uh, society, um, this very, very small island with 500 banks, all these banks. So there's an awful lot of money sitting there mm. in the Cayman Islands, in, these, in the safes. And it's a, uh, it's a tax haven. And of course, people have understandably views about uh, tax havens, and not everybody approves of them. Um, and I deal with some of that in this, mm. in, in this book. But there is a community there, and they lead this rather, uh, rather unusual life. And Clover, uh, the, the girl who's at the center of that book, is, is from such a, such a family. Mm. And born there, in fact. Born and Clover, there, yes. Clover is the name that this character gives herself at the age of four. And the story, it's a beautiful story, is about um, her falling in love with her best friend James when they're both six. And there's a beautiful passage which Alexander's agreed to read for me, um, or for us, uh, where it's told from the point of view of Clover's mother, Amanda, where she's reflecting on her daughter's devotion to James. I wonder if you mind... Yes, certainly. Yes, the, yes, I was asked just to read this uh, paragraph. It's just a brief paragraph. And I suppose it deals with the, the, the central point that, that actually love can strike at any age. And indeed, in this case, love strikes early and continues. Uh, the whole story is about Clover's affection for James over the years and undeclared, undeclared love, which is a problem. She tried to remember, this is what, uh, this is Clovis' mother, Amanda. She tried to remember what it had been like at that age. The problem was that we so quickly forgot that even young children have intense feelings for others. Passionate adoration does not suddenly arrive ready-made when one is 15 or 16, the stage of the first fumbling romance. Falling head over heels for another can occur years earlier, and we would understand these things better if only we bothered to remember. The intensity, that intensity of feeling for a friend was usually not expressed in any physical way, but it represented a yearning that was already knocking at the door. So that's what she, she, she feels about, about James. And of course, later on, it becomes, um, it, it becomes more, more overt and, and, and uh, it's, it's clearer what it is, mm. which is this, this, this great affection. But it's, it's very sad that she can't, she can't mm. tell him. Mm. And I think there are people who probably go through their lives um, loving another person and not being able to tell that person, or the other person is taken by somebody else. Mm. You know, that's mm. really, really a very poignant, a a poignant story, and it's a great theme. Mm. It's quite a noble theme if somebody loves somebody else for year after year after year. Um, that that's really says quite a lot about mm. human loyalty. Mm. Mm -hmm. And I'm afraid it is possibly the lot of, of, of some people that they have that sense mm. that they've loved that person, but they've never been able to do anything about it. Anything public about it. I loved that passage because it really resonated um, for me. I thought of all the, the friendships that I still have that started as, as passionate friendships as yes. a small child. Yep. And it struck me reading that and, and thinking about the children's books, the akimbo books, um, not to mention Bertie in the Scotland Street series, who I'm sure is a favourite character of many here. You offer, offer wonderful insights into the thoughts and emotions of children in your books. 
Tell us what it is about their hearts and minds that you so clearly respect. Well, I think I think it's it's uh, there are um, uh, ch uh, children as characters in the in the books, uh, not all that many. I mean, there aren't very many in the um, Botswana books. In fact, people say to me, "Why don't I write more about the foster children uh, whom Mara Motswi and Mr. J.L.B. Matakoni uh, look after?" Um, but certainly in Scotland Street, we've got Bertie, and in Forever Girl, we've got uh, we've got uh, Clover. Uh, so I, I think that uh, it's interesting as as an author to to write about the intensity of the experience of the child and the, the fact that children uh, see the world um, uh, uh, in, this, in this wonderful, fresh way and feel very strongly about the world. As we go, go through life, we become more accustomed to the world. I suppose we become more jaded. We've seen it all before. It's, it's less exciting. But when, when you're younger and you're seeing it for the first time, it's terribly, terribly exciting. And I think if one can somehow capture that, in, in fiction, uh, that's, that's, that's rather nice. Mm. Uh, so um, uh, I do have these uh, uh, charged characters. I've got um, Bertie is one of my absolute favourites in, in Scotland Street, uh, that poor little boy uh, who... Um, he's been six for the last uh, eight years. Um, <laughs> he started off as six in the first book in the series and he's just continued, although he has actually just had a birthday in the most recent one, which is called Bertie's Guide to Life and Mothers. He reaches his seventh birthday, eventually after this long, long <laughs> period. And uh, he, of course, is hoping uh, for uh, a good present. He, he wants, Bertie really wants to be a, a real little boy, uh, and he wants a Swiss Army a pen knife, uh, which is what most little boys, and indeed most men, really want. <laughs> and, um, and he doesn't get it, of course, for his seventh birthday because his, his mother uh, is, is this very pushy, pushy woman and very correct in her attitudes. She would never give him a penknife. Uh, she gives him instead a, a gender-neutral play figure. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but he's thrilled. <laughs> which is uh, actually a doll. And, um, and then he gets a box, a large box, all wrapped up, and he's, he's quite excited by that. But when he opens uh, that up, uh, it's another present uh, from his mother. And it is uh, the junior UN peacekeeping set. <laughs> <laughs> With little blue armbands uh, to uh, very sound. Bertie, I, I feel so sorry for Bertie. Um, his, his mother is, uh, she, although he's only six in most of the books, uh, his mother makes him learn Italian lessons. Uh, he goes for conversazione, Italian conversazione, so he can appreciate Italian culture. He goes for yoga lessons. He goes to, to classes called Yoga for Tots, uh, where the children are so small they can't even sit up and have to be pushed <laughs> into, their, into their yoga positions by their uh, pushy mothers. And um, he, goes, uh, he has music lessons. He uh, learns the saxophone. He does a very good rendition of As Time Goes By uh, from Casablanca, which, of course, in his case, it doesn't. And then uh, and he has psychotherapy. Um, <laughs> He has psychotherapy from a very famous uh, child psychotherapist, Dr. Hugo Febern, author of that classic of child psychotherapy, Shattered to Pieces, Ego Dissolution in a Three-Year-Old Tyrant. And, <laughs> and both, <laughs> poor little Bertie. At the beginning of the books, he, he goes to a, uh, an advanced kindergarten, not an ordinary kindergarten, but an advanced kindergarten. And while he goes to his advanced kindergarten, his mother, Irene, uh, goes to a floatarium uh, where she floats in a flotation chamber to de-stress. And um, she's in her flotation chamber one day and her mobile phone goes and it's uh, the principal of the advanced kindergarten, uh, Miss Christabel McFadgen, on the line, who says, would you kindly come up to the advanced kindergarten? There has been an incident. And so Irene gets out of her flotation chamber and she goes up to the advanced kindergarten to be greeted by a hatchet-faced Miss McFadden, who says, oh, there has been an incident. One of the children has written graffiti on the toilet wall. And uh, Irene bristles and says, well, why do you think it's my Bertie? Why do you blame my Bertie? And Miss McFadden says, uh, because he's the only one who can write. <laughs> <laughs> <And> then... <laughs> 
See, Bertie, um, Bertie flies in the face of something an early childhood educator told, once told me. She said, there is no such thing as a gifted child. There's just parents of gifted children. Parents of gifted children, exactly. But he yes. actually is one. Well, he is. He is. He's, he, he's, he is a smart little boy. But his mother is his big problem. It's a very serious problem, this pushy mother problem. And I gather it's quite serious in Melbourne. I, I've, uh, I've, I've heard that. You've been watching. Uh, I gather that there is quite a, an issue in particular areas. It tends to be associated with particular areas in, in, in cities, but I, I do understand you've got a major problem here in, uh, in Melbourne of uh, overambitious uh, pushy mothers. Uh, we've, got, we've got a very, very big problem in Edinburgh, in Scotland, mm. where I live, uh, with a much higher incidence of pushy mothers in, in Edinburgh than anywhere else in, in Scotland. Uh, the Scottish government's aware of the problem, uh, but uh, we can't really do anything about it. So you're telling us that 44 Scotland Street's actually a documentary? It is. It's, it's, <laughs> it's, 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 social, it's social realism. Uh, every so often I, I, I get Bertie away from his mother because he just wants to be a real little boy. And there was one occasion when he went fishing with his father in the Pentland Hills just outside Edinburgh, and uh, a mist descends. They get, they get lost, and they end up at a... At, at a farmhouse, and the farmer's wife invites them in, and, and in they go. And Bertie realises that there's a real six-year-old boy in this house, leading a real six-year-old boy's life, a little boy called Andy, and he's very kind to Bertie, and he says, Bertie, would you like to see my things? And Bertie says yes, and he goes up to Andy's room, and Andy opens a drawer, and there in the drawer is not one but six Swiss Army pen knives. <laughs> And Bertie's little heart fills with joy <laughs> at the sight of this. And Andy reaches out and takes one of these penknives and says, this, Bertie, is a Swiss Army penknife. The Swiss Army fights only with penknives. <laughs> <laughs> Which is a little-known fact. And so Bertie turns to him and says, do you have psychotherapy? <laughs> and Andy says, no, we mostly have cattle. <laughs> It's so sad, it's so sad. <laughs> but I do, I do actually get rid, I, I do get rid of Irene from time to time. Um, and may, may I read a little letter? Absolutely, I would because, love you to. Because uh, uh, on the subject of getting rid for, of Irene, um, recently they've got rid of Irene in the last book, um, in that Irene entered uh, into uh, a competition uh, run by Emirates Airlines uh, to uh, discover or to, to get the, the best tourist slogan uh, for uh, Dubai. And uh, she won with her, her entry, which was so much sand and so close at hand. <laughs> <laughs> and um, <laughs> so she goes off to Dubai. And uh, by a series of rather sort of unfortunate incidents, her, her suitcase is sent to uh, Buenos Aires. And uh, so she has to get other clothing, and she, the only clothing she can buy is a, um, a Bedouin ladies' outfit, which uh, covers her mostly. And uh, so she's in this, and then she's unfortunately mistaken for a Bedouin sheikh's new wife. And she's taken off into the desert uh, <laughs> to a harem. And she's... And she's in this harem, and the British charge d'affaires tries to get her released by the Bedouin sheikh, but doesn't get very far because the sheikh has been having trouble uh, with his other wives, and Irene seems to have calmed them down uh, because she started uh, a book group in the... Uh... I thought you were going to say she had been doing yoga. <laughs> she, she started a book group in... So, uh, so that's her out of the way. Um, but this, this is a slightly earlier um, uh, disappearance of Irene. Uh, Irene's got a, a favourite charity which sends relief supplies to Romania, and they send out-of-date medicine uh, and out-of-date uh, genes uh, to Romania. And the Romanians don't want either of these, but they, they're going to get them. And um, so there's some trucks going off full of these relief supplies to Romania, and Irene says to Bertie, Bertie, we must go down and say goodbye, wave goodbye to the relief supplies, um, and we'll take your little brother Ulysses. Now, Bertie's little brother Ulysses looks extraordinarily like the psychotherapist, uh, but uh, that's another matter. So they go down, and um, there's a piper there, and he plays, will you know, come back again, and uh, off the trucks go to... Uh, to Romania, and Bertie then looks around for his mother, and she's nowhere to be seen. 
And uh, in fact, what has happened was that Irene had got into the trucks to check on the relief supplies, and they'd closed the bag. And, um, and they don't hear her banging uh, on the side until they reach Hungary. And um, so anyway, so this, this little excerpt, uh, Bertie's mother's missing. Uh, they, Bertie takes Ulysses back to the flat, calls the father at the office, he comes out, they report Irene missing, and indeed she, she the notice is putting, put up saying, have you seen this woman, uh, and so on. And so it's, it's all very sad. And poor little Bertie, his mother's still missing, she's been missing for days, and he has to go back to school. Um, Bertie goes to Steiner School at this does. stage, and where the children all have uh, very strange names, which is what happens at uh, Steiner schools. And um, there's uh, Olive. Well known. <laughs> there's Olive, who's a very nasty little girl, who, who says that Bertie will have to marry her when they're 20, and she says she has it in writing. And then <laughs> Olive's friend, Pansy, and there's Tofu, uh, who is this little boy um, who's Bertie's friend. Uh, Tofu is the son of two very well-known Edinburgh vegans. Um, <laughs> but... Um, uh, <laughs> And, uh, unfortunately, his, his mother's just uh, died of starvation. And so, uh, so there they are. And Bertie, Bertie goes, goes back to school. And he's feeling a bit blue uh, because, you know, he's only six. And although his mother's a terrible pain, he is upset about her being missing. So, but he's got to go back to school. And this is just a page, uh, one page, a little excerpt from a chapter called The Comfort of friends, and uh, Bertie's standing in the, in the playground, and uh, Olive and Pansy come up. They see him standing there looking a little bit, little bit blue because of his mother's absence, and Olive says, you mustn't hold tears in, Bertie. It's better, you know, if you let yourself cry. We won't laugh at you, will we, Pansy? Pansy shook her head. Poor Bertie, you must feel awful, and just think, you were the last one to see her alive. <laughs> that must make you feel really dreadful. <laughs> yes, said Olive, that's really bad. She paused. I don't suppose there's any news yet, is there? I don't think so, said Bertie. The police are looking for her. Maybe she just got lost. Olive looked at him with pity. I don't think so, Bertie, do you? You don't get lost at the end of your own street, do you? No, I don't think she's lost. Uh, she's probably kidnapped, suggested Pansy. Olive considered this possibility. Maybe, she said, people do get kidnapped, even if they don't have all that much money. Maybe they mistook her for some rich person and are holding her in a cellar somewhere. Or an old castle, said Pansy. Could be, said Olive, somewhere like Tantalan Castle. You know that old castle near North Berwick? We went for a picnic there once, and I thought it would be a really good place for kidnappers to hold people. <laughs> Do you know if the police have looked in Tantalan Castle yet, Bertie? <laughs> Bertie shook his head. They put notices up in Scotland Street, he said. They have pictures of my mummy on them. Olive looked disapproving. I don't think that's a very good idea, Bertie. That could annoy the kidnappers. They don't like people going to the police. No, they don't, said Pansy. That's probably made it a whole lot worse. <laughs> Olive agreed. I wonder if they've sent a ransom demand yet, Bertie. Have you had a letter yet? I don't think so, answered Bertie. My dad hasn't said anything about it. Pansy remembered something. Sometimes they cut off the person's ear, Bertie. <laughs> Then they put it in an envelope and send it to their house. That shows they've got the person. That's correct, said Olive. I've heard about that. That happens quite a lot in Italy. But now we're all in the European Union. <laughs> <laughs> they may have sent your mummy's ear already, said Pansy. Maybe your dad just thought it was junk mail and threw it away. <laughs> That's quite possible, said Olive. We never open our junk mail, we just throw it away. It never crosses our mind that there could be somebody's ear in it. <laughs> Are all your books written out of the same drive, or do different series, and indeed the standalone novels, satisfy different desires for you as a writer? That, that, that's very interesting, uh, Angela, and I think they probably do um, speak to different bits of me. Um, so, uh, yes, uh, Scotland Street 
um, satisfies my desire to write about contemporary Edinburgh and to take the brakes off and write that sort of stuff. Um, that, that I enjoy, uh, enjoy greatly, so I have uh, a wonderful time um, uh, writing some things that really are rather fanciful. Um, then I suppose there are other books that, that enable me to, to, to address graver issues. My, my other recent standalone novel, Trains and Lovers, was an example of that. Um, again, part of that actually set in Australia. And that, that was a response, particularly the bit in Australia was a response uh, to uh, a trip that we'd made a few years ago uh, to the Udnadatta tr uh, track and the Birdsall track and, and to the Outback. And I wanted to write about uh, the life of these, these people who led uh, that very isolated life in, in, in the Outback in, in Australia and, and also write about a particular marriage which... which uh, uh, took place in, uh, against that setting. So that's, that, that's a response to landscape, a response to history, a response to a different sort of feeling. So I think, yes, you, you're, you're absolutely right. The, 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 the series addressed dif different concerns of mine. Mm. And um, I think they're a credit to the, um, to the breadth of your interests and also the richness of your character, I suspect. Thank you for the talk. Uh, Alexander, the Corduroy Mansion series were serialised in the yeah. newspapers. Is there any plans to do any more of that? Uh, thank you very much indeed. Yes, Corduroy Mansions uh, was serialised in the Daily Telegraph newspaper in the UK, and I did three, uh, three, uh, three books in that series, uh, Corduroy Mansions, um, Dog Who Came In From The Cold, and a Conspiracy of Friends. And I will do, yes, I'd like to, uh, to write another book in that series, and I, and I will. It's just a question of trying to fit it into the, into the programme. Because there are characters there that I really liked. I liked Terence Moongrove, um, the man who, who, <laughs> who charged his car battery by connecting it to the mains. Um, that, uh, and who, who then suffered a near-death experience. Uh, <laughs> and also there's, there's, a, there's a dog in that that I, I, I get a lot of correspondence about, a, a dog called Freddie de la Haye. Uh, who's a wonderful dog, and I'd like to revisit uh, Freddie's life. Fred, Freddie belongs to a wine dealer in London. He started off his career as a sniffer dog at uh, Heathrow Airport, and then they discovered that all the sniffer dogs, the drug sniffer dogs at Heathrow Airport, uh, were male, and this offended equal opportunity. Um, <laughs> He was a victim of affirmative action. Uh, well, he was, he was. And so they fired half the uh, sniffer dogs and they brought in female sniffer dogs. Bad move. Okay. <laughs> because all the male dogs were then more interested in the female dogs and they didn't sniff any of the drugs. And so, uh, so Freddie then went off to, he went off to a, a very fashionable journalist who looked after him, who made him a vegetarian and uh, also taught him how to put his own safety belt on in the car, and um, not much of a life for him. Then he ended up with William, where he was happier. And he was indeed, he served his country. He was recruited by MI5. Uh, they wanted to get a microphone into a flat full of suspicious Russians. Uh, and um, uh, they, they weren't quite sure how to do that, so they put a, uh, a microphone in Freddie's collar and uh, then sort of put Freddie by the way of the Russians who liked dogs, and they took him into the flat, and Freddie was there transmitting the conversation to the chaps in the van down below. Uh, but unfortunately, one of the Russians became suspicious and took his collar off and ripped it apart and saw a little transmitter which said, property of Her Majesty's government. Oh, and that that's actually... Label on that's, it, you know, that's rather unsubtle. The government mm. shouldn't put that on <laughs> these uh, transmitters. I think if you're going to bug people... Uh, you actually shouldn't do that, or you should put property and then use the other side. Say. That's right, the Russian. <laughs> <laughs> put it in Russian, that would uh, be Property of the KGB, <laughs> that, that, that would be the sort of... Yeah, anyway, so, Fre Freddie, I'd like to get back to, and I, I will write another of, uh, of those. Another question? Uh, thank you. Um, thank you. It's just a piece of uh, trivia I'm interested in, but I think it was one of your Scotland Street novels. You gave us a little insight into the uh, new club by way of voyeurism, really. Yes. And I just wondered whether it's likely to appear again or whether you've been warned off. 
<laughs> well, the new club, the new club. Uh, I, I am actually a member of the, the the new club in in Edinburgh. And what I what I wrote in that book was that there was a secret tunnel underneath Edinburgh, which came up underneath the the new club. And uh, they they were there, and they and they they arrived just at the time that there was a uh, the annual general meeting of the Edinburgh establishment in the <laughs> in the in the new club. And uh, no, they 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 didn't mind. Uh, they they haven't. Uh, I haven't been uh, drummed out uh, of, uh, of, of, of the club. Uh, so I occasionally will, I think I will mention it. I try not to, I do mention real places and real, real people, but I try to do so in a way which won't cause too much uh, offence. Um, I think you actually have to be quite careful mm. uh, because uh, certainly uh, p people can get offended by... Uh, by what might not strike one as being an, uh, uh, an offensive comment. So, so the new club will, will, will probably feature again, and uh, I, d I don't think that they were too upset at having a little bit of fun at their uh, expense. Lucky. The new club has, has associate membership with the Melbourne Club, oh, okay. I think, so I could write about the Mel Melbourne Club. <laughs> do, do they have the annual general meeting of the <laughs> Melbourne establishment in the... <laughs> Quite possibly. Who knows, who but knows. But I did, I did read a story about a um, fabric market in France suing a crime writer for... Really? Yes, for the story that she set in there. They felt that it brought their... Um, their business into disrepute. So, well, yes, I think you. I think you have to be careful. You, you, you have to. You also wouldn't want to cause distress unnecessarily to, uh, to, to, to people. Uh, so, I think you, you do have to be a little bit, uh, a little bit careful. I mean, for example, if you, as a crime writer, if you set a murder scene in a restaurant in an actual restaurant, uh, you could well imagine that the restaurant would say, uh, actually, in Melbourne, that uh, yeah. happens. Does it? Quite a lot. Well. <laughs> Is yes. <laughs> Have you seen the Underbelly series? We'll talk about really, it. Yes, really, really. Yes. Oh well. P is... Don't go to pizza restaurants in Carlton. Really. Oh, uh -huh. that's well, there you are. <laughs> Thank you very much for the tip. Will you give me a list of places where it's safe to go? Uh... Certainly. <laughs> Certainly. They'll all be the sort of places frequented by Bertie's mother. Thank, <laughs> Thank you also for uh, for your uh, your talk. Up here on the balcony. Sorry, I just can't see, but there, there you are. Um, you talked about the, the traditions of, uh, of Botswana and the, the gentleness, um, and talking to a number of people from, from Botswana, they're, they're, they're very impressed with, uh, with the books. And um, uh, I wonder how the scourge of AIDS, which is something else that's very, uh, very high on their mind, yes. um, presents you with challenges in terms of, uh, of, of, of writing, because it's certainly very discordant with the, the traditions and the, um, the gentleness that you've been talking about. Yes, uh, well, thank you for that. That's, that's a very interesting point. Uh, Botswana, as you know, uh, has, um, like in many other countries in, in sub-Saharan Africa, uh, had terrible, um, terrible tr uh, problems with uh, HIV AIDS. Um, you know, really pr pretty serious. Uh, I think sometimes we don't realize uh, just how uh, serious it, it is. Um, the infection rates in, uh, in Botswana generally in the 19 to 45 age, age group would be in the lo lower 30 percent. Now, that, you know, that's really, really so sad, just at a time when so many African countries were feeling that they were making great progress with dealing with um, infectious disease and, and, and managing to, to get on top of tuberculosis, for example. Mm -hmm. Along comes this, this absolutely dreadful a, a, a dreadful uh, development. And so it was very, very uh, sad for them. Um, I feel that I, I, don't, I shouldn't say too much about that in the, in the Botswana books uh, for the following reason. Um, firstly, if I put H HIV AIDS center stage, it would convert the books at a stroke into tragedies. And that I don't think is, is what I'm, I should be doing. Um, there are plenty of people who are writing about uh, the um, AIDS uh, epidemic in, in, um, in Africa and writing very well about it and, and, and bringing it to people's attention. And I, I, I feel that I don't actually need to, to add my tuppence worth to, uh, to that. The other thing is uh, that um, if you do that, uh, if you write in fiction about the sorrow um, and... Um, the, the problems of others, uh, you, you actually 
uh, have to be, I think, very careful in, about intruding into people's grief. And Botswana, like all those countries, has suffered great um, grief uh, over, this, over this, the, 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 this issue. They aren't denying it. Uh, they're dealing with it. The government of Botswana actually has a, a very good program. Uh, they were in a position uh, relatively early to afford the antiretroviral um, uh, drugs. And so they, they, they've got a very good program uh, of, of that. And I felt that um, I, I think they, they, they don't actually want to be portrayed to the world as being, as being ill. Who would mm. want, want that? So I discussed it with friends of mine in, in Botswana who were working uh, with HIV AIDS and uh, discussed my position on this. And, and, and in fact, they said that they thought that the approach that I was taking was, was right, that I should, should deal with the positive things as well, because there's so many people write just about the negative mm. aspects of, of, of Africa. And if I joined, joined the, the, the ranks of, of those doing that, then, well, in, in a way, uh, we, we might not hear the positive story mm. Quite, mm. So, quite so much. So it was a very delicate decision. Um, I wasn't ignoring it. I was thinking about it. And indeed, you will see it there in the books if you, if, 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 if you look carefully. For example, Mama Kutsi's um, brother Richard dies of AIDS, and I describe his death there. And it's very apparent what it's about. Mm. But they, they don't use the, 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 the words. She doesn't, Mama Kutsi doesn't say her brother died of AIDS, because she wouldn't in real life. No. She wouldn't do that. You've, you've, you've got experience of, of working with this problem in, in, in the Far East, and you, you know the, the sensitivities mm. about it. It's a very, very delicate, uh, delicate issue. And so that's my position on that. And I feel I can defend it, and I feel that, that I, I have been careful to discuss it with people who, uh, who are very much involved, in it. and I've been involved in, in a small way with the um, Harvard AIDS Project, for example, which has been doing great work uh, in, that, in that part of the world. So I'm, I'm certainly conscious of it, uh, but I feel I must be very careful in, in the way in which I, I, I deal with it. And I don't think I would be doing anybody any favours if I started to, to introduce it into the books more prominently than I currently uh, deal with it. Thank you. Thank you for that question. We've probably got time for one, maybe two more if they're kept quick. I can see people queuing on the balcony. Can we stay with the Sorry. balcony people? Um, Sandy, no. when can we hope for another 44 Scotland Street? And there have long been rumours of a tunnel under <laughs> Collins Street from the Melbourne Club to the Elegant <laughs> Ladies Club. Just down the road. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I'm writing another of Scotland Street uh, as we speak, so to speak. I've started volume 10, and that'll come out next, uh, next year. It's going to be called The Revolving Door of Life, and uh, I'm, I'm really enjoying it. Yes. I've only written, written about four or five chapters so far, but uh, it, will, it will come out, and I'm delighted to hear about tunnels in Melbourne, and I'd like to investigate that further because I think there are a lot of conspiracy theorists who feel that there are all sorts of tunnels. Absolutely. <laughs> and uh, I think let's, let's fire them up. Absolutely. absolutely. <laughs> and Ballarat, Ballarat, we're going tomorrow. Oh, Ballarat's night. Got, all of them. It's built a on a mine. Oh, my goodness. The ton the, well, yes, there you are. There's some rich fodder yes, there. Yes. Have, have we got time for one more <laughs> upstairs? Thank you, down here. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Um, I'm interested in Bertie's father, who hasn't had a mention here yet tonight, and I note that recently he's been getting more courageous in his relationship with Irene, and I wonder how that might impact on Bertie's relationship with her. And perhaps you could expand. Well, I think that's... Thank you for that. Um, I don't know... May I just ask you, are you keen to see that development? Would you like to see, uh, to see Stuart standing up to her more? Right. Oh, there you go. I think that's that's more or less my, my view because he, he every so often he starts to stand up to her, but she really is she's pretty frightening uh, piece of uh, piece of work. What I'm planning is that she's going to be stuck in Dubai for about five to six months, uh, and uh, uh, 
That'll so, give Stuart a bit of time to, well, that'll give to him establish a bit of time. himself. But, in fact, what I'm also planning is that Bertie's grandmother's going to come and help. And I think she might... I think she'll be Australian. There'll be an Australian <laughs> grandmother who will Lovely. be very nice, very spirited. She'll... You know, get Bertie. Get, well, she'd certainly give him the Swiss Army. She'd get him out. And, uh, <laughs> and he'll have. And so I get think. Get him out of Steiner School. Yeah. Uh, well, no, he'll he'll still be in the Steiner School, but she, she'll she'll liven that up as well. And so I think I think we will will have that. Uh, but the the difficulty with dealing with Stuart is that I don't know whether. I mean, some people say just get rid of Irene. I mean, some people say a flotation accident. <laughs> uh, that she, you know, a, a miscalculation of the specific gravity of the, of this, uh, of the, uh, the fluid in the uh, flotation chamber. Uh, she could sink. Uh, uh, so, so that's one possibility. Uh, but I, I don't, you see, I don't want Bertie to lose his mother. Mm. That's, the, that's the problem. And uh, that, so it's really, really very... Very difficult. Uh, Stuart, I mean, st people say just Stuart should just take him off, and 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 uh, he and Bertie and Ulysses, which could leave Ulysses with. Mind you, Ulysses doesn't like Irene uh, because Ulysses is sick whenever she picks him up. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> but where's the dramatic tension in that? If they all. If so I do. Yes, I do know. They have to stay together. Stuart, Stuart, uh, Stuart is, is is sailing fairly close to the wind in his job. He's a statistician uh, for the Scottish government, and he has. He's, sometimes he doesn't really get around to working out the precise figures. And uh, <laughs> he was asked by the Scottish government to give some projection for North Sea oil production over the coming years. And he hadn't worked it out, and he saw, he saw the Scotsman Sudoku column. <laughs> <laughs> so he just transcribed the figures from the Sudoku. <laughs> and the, the minister was delighted. <laughs> I'll bet. <laughs> and that, I think, actually is... I, 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 you know, I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but I think quite a lot of government figures actually bear an uncanny relation... <laughs> <laughs> to the Sudoku results. <laughs> there we go. I think we should all have a close look at that. We've, <laughs> we've run out of time for more questions, but please, um, um, Alexander will be available for book signing after we finish the interview, and um, so bring your questions and your compliments to him. But before we, um, we wrap up, I wanted to ask you, and I know this is a really tricky question to ask the author of, of 70 works, more so if you count your non-fiction, but what are you most proud of having written? We've run out of time, actually. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I, 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 I really don't. I really don't know. Um, I, uh, Is that I, the first thing that comes into your mind when I ask that question? Well, it, it, yes, it's just like one of those ink blot tests, what I see. <laughs> um, I think... Uh, I actually really don't know. I suppose I... Um, grateful that I wrote The Number One Ladies Detective Agency um, because that changed, changed everything for me. Whether I'm proudest of that, I, 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 I don't know. I, I'm, very, I'm very proud of having written Bertie. I, I really, really like that. Mm -hmm. um, um, and I think... Actually, I would answer... Maybe I would answer by saying that I'm probably proudest of some of the poems at the end of the Scotland Street. There are one or two poems that I put there, and, and I think some of the things I... Uh, can I finish by yes, reading? I was going to say, I've, 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 one, sorry, I hadn't planned to do this, but no, you, I've, I've, I'll I've finish with a poem. Lovely. This is a poem from this particular one, which is The um, uh, Importance of Being Seven. It's, I always put it into the mouth of Angus Lordy, and um, uh, he's talking about Scotland, but I think you could change it if you wanted to, and to. It could be about anywhere. This is his poem. Dear friends, there's no timetable for happiness. It moves, I think, according to rules of its own. When I was a boy, I thought I'd be happy tomorrow. As a young man, I thought it would be next week. Last month, I thought it would be never. Today, I know it is now. Each of us, I suppose, has at least one person who thinks that our manifest faults are worth ignoring. I've found mine, and I'm content. When we are far from home, we think of home. 
I, who am happy today, think of those in Scotland for whom such happiness might seem elusive. May such powers as listen to what is said by people like me and olive groves like this, grant to those who want friendship a friend, attend to the needs of those who have little, hold the hand of those who are lonely, allow Scotland, our place, our country, to sing in the language of her choosing, that song she's always wanted to sing, which is of brotherhood, which is of love. That's it. Perfect, thank you. Thank you very much.